spiritual. How can it be that most of my life I've lived in an area where there are probably nine Palestinians for each Israeli, and for 33 years I've never met even one Palestinian. <clears throat> Thank you very much for having us tonight. It's really exciting. This is the first stop in our U.S. tour. I see the room is full. We very appreciate all the efforts and all the people who came out here tonight. I'm a Jew. I'm a Zionist and I'm a settler. When I say I'm a Jew, I'm talking, of course, not about a religion. I'm talking about a 3,000-year-old people. I'm talking about a sense of identity in which I'm a link in a chain of tradition in which every single link is part of who I am. And I know as a member of the Jewish people <clears throat> that for 3,000 years we've been connected to a certain piece of real estate in the Middle East. From the very beginning, from the beginning of the book of Genesis, there's been no way to separate the Jewish people from the land of Israel. Therefore, my Zionism flows directly from my sense of being a member of the Jewish people. I was born in New York when I was 18. I picked up my two bags. I made Aliyah and sent it to the Holy Land because I wanted to be a meaningful link in the Jewish people and be part of the recreation of our age-old identity in our ancient homeland. I knew, just as you know, that for 2,000 years we've been in exile since the Romans destroyed the Jewish Commonwealth in the year 70 of the Kamen era. And since then we've been in Europe, we've been in the Middle East, Recently, we've been in America, and for most of those years, we've had a sense that we're not where we're supposed to be. We're just marching in place, we're treading water in limbo, waiting for the day we can come back to our homeland and be the sovereign people we were meant to be. So when I made Aliyah at the age of 18, I had a sense that I was fulfilling 2,000 years of dreams, and that was exciting, that was meaningful. <clears throat> and when I made Aliyah, I moved to the West Bank, I didn't move to the coastal cities because I wanted to be at the heart of Jewish history. The map calls that the West Bank, but I call Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria, not to make a political statement, but to make a historical statement. During most of the thousand years when the Jewish people lived in our land, we lived there on the West Bank. That's where we have our history. That's where we have our artifacts. And I call Judea and Samaria because that's what the Bible calls it. I call it what we have called it for our history because it's all about being a link in a chain of tradition. Where I live in Judea, south of Jerusalem, there's so many places you can scratch the ground with your heel and come up with potsherds that our ancestors left 2,000 years ago. Those potsherds speak to me. They say, we're part of you and you're part of me. My neighbors and myself and my family, we all learn Bible, but not just in the classroom. We take the Bible, put it in our backpacks, go outside, read the verses, and walk in the footsteps of what's being described, and you feel that sense of historical continuity, a link in a chain of tradition, picking up where our forefathers left off 2,000 years ago. There's nothing more exciting than that. And I have a sense that the strength of my identity has blinded me my whole life to another story. For 33 years living in the heart of the Jewish people, the heart of our land, I didn't see the Palestinians because they weren't part of our story, of my story. I was blind to their existence. They were like the great draft scenery that passes in the background of a movie but is not part of the plot. They weren't supposed to be there, so I didn't see them. I was blind. And then five years ago, I was driving my car with two guests from the U.S. who wanted to see the flourishing of Jewish settlement, who wanted to see how the visions of the biblical prophets are now coming true before our eyes. I showed them around the settlements of Judea. We drove from place to place. I picked up a hitchhiker, picked up a second one. When the second hitchhiker got into the car, one of my guests, who was a pastor from Texas, he said to me, Hanan, that's beautiful you did. You pick up hitchhikers. Wow, back in Texas where I come from, no one does that. And I said to him, Bob, it's not just me. Around here we all pick up hitchhikers. We trust each other. We have a common vision. And like everyone else, I do my best to pick up every person who puts out his finger for a ride. And by the time I finished that sentence, I realized that I was lying. I was lying to Bob 
and even worse, I was lying to myself. I don't pick up every person who puts out his finger. I pick up only Israelis. I don't pick up Palestinians. So how was I able to say to myself and about that I pick up every person? I realize at that moment that means either I don't see the Palestinians or I don't see them as human beings. And in that moment, I realize it's something wrong with me. And I have to do something. But I have to meet my neighbors, the Palestinians. I have to bring them into my sense of, of reality. But there was no way to do it. I knew no one who has any connections. We as Jews and Palestinians live so close to each other. We drive on the same roads, but no one knows each other. There's no connection. Different towns and villages we live in. We have different religions, different places of worship, different school systems, different economic systems. We live under different legal systems, different municipalities, different media. The news they know is not the news I know. Completely different worlds. How are we going to meet? There was no way. And then I began to see that we live so close but so far away and therefore we have all this ignorance of the other, all this distance, suspicion. We have stereotypes, even racism, and so much fear of the other. It happened over Facebook that I made a connection with Palestinians. I got invited to, to meet them. The time rolled around when I was supposed to go to the meeting. I told my wife I was about to go out. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to meet Palestinians. And she screamed, she said, don't go, they'll kill you. And I approached my wife, I saw the terror in her eyes. She begged me not to go. I went anyway. I didn't have to take the car. It was a 20-minute walk through the fields, of, fields and orchards around my home. I was frightened, my heart was pounding, didn't know what would happen to me, what they'd do to me. And I came to the place, it was a clearing, surrounded by a rock fence, Palestinian land. I walked in and I saw something inside the camp be. I saw 15 Israelis, 15 Palestinians, you know they were doing to each other, they were talking. Wow, that doesn't happen where we come from. I saw this Palestinian woman, she was dressed in brown from head to toe, I can see only her face. I walked over, clearly an observant Muslim, I said hello to her in English, she said hello back to me. We talked about a minute, and I said, wow, I can't believe I'm talking to you. And she said to me, I can't believe I'm talking to you because we don't talk to Israeli settlers. It could have been the end of the conversation. We talked another minute, then her son came over. Yazid was 17 years old. We shake hands, he and I. He's wearing a windbreaker, and on the jacket are three words over the lapel that says, Seeds of Peace. Anyone here ever heard of Seeds of Peace? Hands? Wow! That's almost 20% of you. But I had no idea then what Seeds of Peace is. I said to myself, he's a Palestinian. The jacket says peace. He can't know what the jacket says. Perhaps someone gave it to him and found it on the floor. If he knew, he wouldn't wear the jacket. I said jokingly, Yasin, what's this seeds of peace thing? I thought he'd say, I don't know. He told me it's a camp in Maine, USA. It takes Palestinian kids and Israeli kids out of the conflict zone for a summer of recreation and reconciliation. He said he just got back from the camp. He was there that summer, made his early friends. They're friends on Facebook. And now he was so affected, he said, so transformed by that summer that he wants to spend some of his life building bridges of reconciliation between our two peoples. And I don't know if I can believe what he's saying, because it flies in the face of everything. I know to be true. Palestinians, they don't even know peace. I was confused. Five minutes have passed. I met his father. I met many other Palestinians that day. I heard stories of identity that challenged me to the very core. I heard stories of suffering under Israeli occupation. I said to myself, that couldn't be. I've never seen occupation here. What's going on? I see the return of the Jewish people after 2,000 years of exile, and they tell me that our Jewish triumph is their Palestinian tragedy. I was so challenged by hearing the things I heard and meeting the people I met. I went home that day, and I realized that I've lived in the land for 33 years, but I've known only part of the reality. I was challenged, I was depressed, I was didn't know what to do with my identity. They say this is Palestine, but I say it's Israel. They say it's their land, but I say it's my land. I realized I had to learn more. I met Palestinians over the course of many months. I thought, I listened, they listened to me. And gradually, I began to reach a place of realizing 
that in this land, both sides build their identity upon the nullification of the other side's identity. We both go to sleep at night, hoping and praying that the other side's going to disappear tomorrow, because they don't belong here, only we do. They'll get the message after 5, 10, 15 years, 100 years, they'll leave. But you know what? As I began to meet more Palestinians and understand more deeply, I began to see that as we belong in the land, so do they. It's the land of Israel and it's the land of Palestine at the same time. I began to realize that neither side is going to get up and leave. I began to see that we have to come to a place where we have our nation on our right shoulder, but we have the other nation, the other people on our left shoulder. We have to contain both truths and both identities. We have to expand our hearts to include the other. It's so hard to listen to them because it's so different than what we know, their understanding of history, of reality. And I began to apply Jewish teachings to what I've been going through, expanding my identity. Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cohen Cook was the first chief rabbi of the land of Israel going back a hundred years ago. And as a mystic, he said that the world is full of sparks of truth. We have our Jewish truth and it's our foundation, but there's also a little bit of truth by the Muslims and by the Christians and by others who have to gather in the sparks of truth. And he asked himself a question. If the world is full of sparks of truth, is anything false? If it's all true, is there any falsehood out there? And his answer was that, unfortunately, the world is full of falsehood. Falsehood is partial truth, masquerading as complete truth. If you think you have it all, then you don't. You have to expand your purview to include other partial truths. In roots, Shoshin Tudor, the Israeli Palestinian grassroots initiative for understanding nonviolence and transformation, we've created a framework for neighbors to meet neighbors, to listen till it hurts, to be challenged by the other's narrative of who he is and who I am. We've learned in roots that the normal way of doing things is that I tell you who you are and you tell me who I am, but it can't be like that. We have to let the other tell us who they are. We have to listen to that. In roots, we listen. We create frameworks for dialogue. We created a community center called Merkaz Karama, the Dignity Center, the only place in the whole West Bank where Israelis and Palestinians can meet in quality and dignity. And there, people cross that red line in the center and says, you can't meet the other side, you can't shake hands, you can't listen. And we begin to expand our identities to see legitimacy and to see suffering and pain on the other side. We have programs for little kids, after school activities. We have a summer camp for the kids. We have a, another summer camp for the older kids. Photography workshops for women and for little kids. We have a music therapy group, a, a trauma group. We have a youth movement that meets twice a month of high school kids. Everything is the two sides together. We work with Israeli kids before the army. We work with soldiers. We have lectures. We have religious celebrations together. And we begin to see humanity and legitimacy on the other side. We expand our identity. But you know what? We've learned in roots that the dialogue is essential. It's preparing the human groundwork for future peace settlement. But the dialogue's not enough. You have to do something about it. Because we come to see that if we've been living our lives based on only half of the truth, thinking it's the whole truth, then we've probably also been practicing our identity in a fashion that tramples the other side's dignity and human rights. Palestinians live out their lives as if we Israelis have no right to the land and Jews don't belong there. And we Israelis do the same thing to them. We each live at the expense of the other. So at roots, we're involved in dialogue, we're understanding each other, but we're also trying to create a new model of coexistence in the land that will leave room for both sides to express their dignity and humanity in that little sliver of land that we both call home. Thank you very much.
going to have my flag to these two flags. <laughs> I'm sharing about what? I'm Palestinian, 27 years old Palestinian, as you can see, I'm not very old. But what it means to grow up in Palestine? To grow up in Palestine, you didn't need somebody to come and tell you you should hate these people. The danger that you're going to live in, the things that you're going to face, the soldiers you're going to face, the checkpoint that you cannot cross, is more than enough to make you hate the one who's causing that suffer for you. From that point, the hatred starts inside me and inside everyone towards the one who's making us suffer our life. And after that, also my uncle was murdered by an Israeli soldier in the entrance of Beit Yomar. So it turned to be not only hatred, it's also a sense of revenge. Like now I'm losing people because of the Israelis. What should I do against it? But I was really young, I couldn't think about anything to do about it. So after that, my family joined an organization for peace. And they started to ask me to join one of their peace camps, of course. My answer was no. I'm not going to go to those people who they killed my uncle. Who I'm suffering because of them. I don't want to see that soldiers who are standing in front of my house, going to check my bag every day and coming back from my school. So I didn't join. And in 2004, my brother did shot in his leg by an Israeli soldier. That made me even hate more, but the truth is that his life was saved by an Israeli doctor. She spent like 36 hours doing aid surgery to him until she saved his life. That was a shock to me, but at the same time, I had to admit that I can't hurt that doctor and I will live my whole life to protect her and to just try to make up for her from so doing the most biggest favor can anybody do to me, which is saving my brother's life, but to be honest, that was not enough to say I don't hate him anymore. That was not that much simple, so I said, okay, she saved his life, that's it, I'm gonna accept the Israelis, I love them, I'm gonna have peace with them. No, it was not like that, it's much, much bigger than that, because I still hate. But at least, I have some respect for that doctrine. And I opened my eyes to the fact that I cannot have my revenge from the whole society, I cannot plan the whole society for one man's fault. But even that was not enough for me to be treated with that hatred. And after a few years from that, I said to myself, I'll go one time to those meetings that they're doing. I just want to see what they're doing. So I went first time, and second time, and third time. And to be honest, I used to enjoy my time. People talking about good things, talking about good luck, talking about peace. But the fact is, every time after those meetings, when I go back to where I come from, I find out that that soldier is still in front of my house. I find out that I'm still suffering. I'm still living in a big jail that, who controls my freedom. There's a soldier standing in front of my village and close the gate anytime he wants, and I would be locked inside my house. So why am I doing those meetings? Why am I going? To those people who we are talking about peace and they are giving me the feeling that we are living that peace. And then I have to go back to the reality and face again the fact that I don't want to face it. So nothing is changing. So I stopped going to any kind of those meetings because it's not changing anything for me. And I said before I take any decision, I have to understand first of all who I'm hating and why we are fighting for. What's this conflict is all about? Some people say it's about religion, we are Muslims, they are Jewish, we hate all the Jewish people. So I say to myself, it's not true. Because to be a Muslim, and a deep Muslim, you have to believe in the three religions. You have to believe in Judaism, in the Christianity, and in the Islam. Because this three religions is from the God, our God. So it cannot be that I would hate people for what my God did. They did not create their own religion, and I didn't have a problem with the Judaism because my prophet Musa, Moshe was a Jewish, so I should hate him as well if I want to hate all the people for their religion. And why I hate the Jewish, not the Christian. So it's not about religion. It's about the land. Yes, it is. We're fighting for that land. 
But is it the right thing to do is to keep killing each other until nobody will be alive to achieve that man? To keep living our life with that dream that one day we're going to wake up and they're going to disappear? No, no, no. Next day the Palestinians are not going anywhere. And the Israelis are not going anywhere. There is a fact and there is a dream. Of course, for me, all of Palestine, the whole land is Palestine. For me, my identity, my feeling, how I feel the land, I will be alive. I will say I will be happy that half of it will be Israel. No, we have to be honest with ourselves before we are being honest with the people. For me as a Palestinian, I always wanted to be all of Palestine. This is how I feel it. But there is a fact that there is two people next to here. And the more I can say is two people who belong to this land. I can't say that I don't belong to this land or they don't belong to this land. Everybody belongs to this land, but I do have the right to say you can come and live with me equal. You cannot come and occupy my land and occupy my life. You cannot have your rights in the extremes of my life. Why I don't feel equal with you? Why your freedom has to be based on my freedom? So from that point, I said, okay, so my problem is not with the Jewish people. My problem is not with the citizens. My problem is with the occupation. My problem is with what's taking my freedom from me. What's killing us. So should I use violence to be against this? Okay, even if I use violence, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna kill someone. I'm gonna get two, three, and then they're gonna kill me. Okay, the four of us will die. What did I achieve from that? What did my people mm -hmm. achieve from that? Nothing. What they're gonna say to me, I'm a hero, and they're gonna write my name in the walls, and they're gonna be proud of me. Proud of me for doing what? For doing nothing. And at the same time, I know many people would say, but they are killing us. They are coming, killing our kids. Okay, I know. But I cannot be a killer. I cannot give a chance to this conflict, not only to occupy my land, also to occupy my mind and my feeling to tell me to be a killer, because in the end of all, I'm a human being. From that point, I decided to join the Peace Force. And I joined groups. And I become the youth director for four years, 20 from each side, from the age 16 to 18, because that was the age I was having to understand more. And this is the age that they can understand more and decide if they want to do violence, if they want to hate, what they want to do, how they're going to think about their life. This age, from the Israeli side, the age before they go to the army, before they hold their guns against the Palestinians. So the first thing I tell them, why to wait until you meet in the checkpoint? Why to wait until you will have your gun in your hand and you will have rocks or knives in your hand and then you try to kill each other. Why did you give a second and talk before you're doing that? I'm not telling you don't hate. I'm not telling you forget about your suffering because I didn't forget about my suffering. Nobody can just come and say, that's it. The past is past. I don't feel pain. I'm okay. Let's talk. No, 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 no. You can't hate because this is how you feel. But who you hate? Do you hate this young man who's sitting beside you? What did he do to you? That soldier shoot you? Okay, but this is not the same soldier. If that person is a killer, does it mean that his kid's gonna be killer? You cannot judge them for that. So from that point, the dialogue starts to happen. And people start, first of all, to talk to each other. And waiting for me, in that group to tell them and to talk to them about peace, which is something I didn't do. That's what they expect, but I didn't. I told them something else. So then I don't want you even to think about peace and that you are coming to a peace meeting. I want you to think about something else. You both are coming as human beings meeting. Okay? You are angry, you hate Israelis, you hate soldiers. Okay, this is gonna be the future soldier. Tell him why you hate him. Because he didn't know, he had no idea, because from his side, he's going to the army because he has the honor to serve his country, to protect his people, but we have no idea that for you as a Palestinian, the only reason he's going to the army is to shoot you, is to kill you, to be a killer. Tell him why you think about him that way. 
Then then why you do want them to come to your house in the middle of the night to wake you up, to arrest you, to do anything for you? So just you both take a chance to be brave enough to explain to each other why you angry from each other because both you can know. The second thing, before you talk about peace, be honest with yourself. If you don't have your rights, if you don't feel yourself equal citizen, if you don't feel the life, how you can say, I want to live in peace? You can't. First, ask for your rights. We don't want this fake peace that based in nothing. Based on fake feelings, you just show a fake smile, you just give it, but inside you, you're full of faith. We don't want that fake peace. If you want to really have peace and have life, first be honest with yourself and with the one in front of you, the one you have problem with. Ask for your rights, both of you, so you can. If you want to live together in the future, you will not feel yourself less than him. You will not feel himself less than you. You will be equal. You will be added to live together. And after that, one thing happened that opened my mind to something which is more dangerous. I was driving my car to Goshaksuan Junction, going to the center, the Kasparama. And we are crossing Goshaksuan Junction, and Israeli lady went to cross the street, so I stopped my car. And she looked at my license plate color, it's green, that means it's a Palestinian car, so she stopped. She was afraid that she would be in the middle of the street, I'm going to hit her. A soldier standing at that junction, he aimed his gun in my head, he didn't know what I'm going to do at that junction. I want to hit her or I just stop so she can cross the street. I'm sitting in my car doing nothing. I have no idea what to do. I just stop my car so she can pass. And I looked at her and at that soldier and I said to myself, what crazy situation that we, we reach in our country. That soldier could kill me because he's afraid that I'm going to hit her. That woman could cause my death because she's afraid that I'm going to kill her with my car. I could die for just being a gentleman. That's a reason to die where we come from. But that means one thing to me, that this conflict is not controlled by power anymore. It's not controlled by the one who has the gun in his hand. It's controlled by the fear. Because this conflict succeeds to occupy people's minds and people's feelings. So for the Israelis, all the Palestinians are dangerous. They have to kill them all. For the Palestinians, all the Israelis are dangerous. They have to kill them all. Because they are afraid of each other. You're walking as a Palestinian and there is hundreds of Israelis. You don't know in any second one of them going to pull his gun and shoot you. Because he's also walking and seeing you. He doesn't know in any second he will pull your knife and kill him. So the danger is coming from everybody. And when you feel afraid from every single person you meet, you can do anything to protect yourself. So when we reach that level, that we are afraid of each other, that means you have to do something. For me, as Shadi, the last thing I want to face is a gun not controlled by soldiers' hands, it's controlled by soldiers' feet. Because that gun, I have no idea if I'm Palestinian, Israeli, and nothing. The only thing that that gun controlled by fear can do is kill people. And this is the last thing I want. So from that in roots, I know it takes two months, two minutes, the last thing I'm going to say. <laughs> I speak a lot. <laughs> so from that point, I, we decided in the youth group we should start to meet with the free military school. The Nupina, it's a program that the youth will go for six months all around Israel before they go to the army. So I said, you're going to meet with them before they have their guns in their hand. So at least they can have an idea what kind of people they're going to face. What kind of people they're going to see in that checkpoint. Why do you need to wait for the mistake to happen? Sometimes you say, okay, they can do the mistakes where they can there. But when we come from the mistake, the price of the mistake is people's life. So there is no place for mistake. The only way to do it is to try to avoid the mistake. Okay, he didn't know me, let me sit with him, talk to him. Let me tell him that I don't want to kill you, but at least I don't want you to try to kill me. Don't give me a reason to hate you. And from that point, we believe that there is no solution we can think about yet before we start to do work people to people, building trust between people, building 
arise between the people so they can in the future live any kind of solution we're gonna talk about the solution that gonna guarantee the dignity and the rights for both sides to live in the whole land wherever they want as a free citizen in the country that they love. Thank you.